Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Ryan Bergen, Editor-in-Chief of CIM Magazine, and today's presentation is Mental Health Awareness. So before we get started, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. First, to ensure you have optimal audio, make sure that if you are using your computer audio, that the button for computer audio is selected on your control panel. And if you dialed in on your phone, ensure the phone button is selected. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, the questions will be held until the Q&A period after the presentation. And just remember when you are entering those questions, please take a moment to give them a proofread uh, so we can be sure not to mangle them. Um, note that we will have also have some poll questions during the presentation. So keep an eye out for those and please share your perspectives. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We are excited to be partnering with Health and Safety Society to be able to bring this series to you. And I'm very happy to have uh, Nelson Bonerchuk back with us who to both host and help make this series happen. Uh, Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and vice president for health and safety at Torex Gold Resources. Nelson. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks to everyone for being here today. Uh, this episode of The Safety Share will focus on mental health awareness in mining. What we know, what we've learned, and what we can do as team leaders and team members to improve it. Lifestyle choices, relationships, and the ability to balance home and work life can all play a role, along with work environment, schedule demands, and job satisfaction, among other things. Our guests today are Keith Hansen and Dr. Michelle LaRiviere. Keith has 30 years of experience designing and implementing disability management, occupational rehabilitation, and workplace mental health programs, with 23 of those years working in the mining industry. Keith was a national director of mental health uh, strategy at LifeMark. Prior to that, he worked 11 years with Valet at their Canadian operations leading occupational medicine, disability management, and mental health programs, where he initiated and led the Mining Mental Health Study, the most comprehensive and first of its kind in the industry. As, as of this month, he has taken on a new challenge as the Superintendent of Occupational Health and Wellness with Cote Gold. And also joining us today is Dr. Michelle LaRiviere. He's a clinical psychologist and full professor at Laurentian University. Dr. Michelle and his team complete, completed the Mining Mental Health Study and for the last 25 years, he's completed several large scale studies focusing on health and well being of workers in various occupations, including healthcare, corrections, human services, and first responders. Today, these two are partnering up again and will walk us through their experience and what they've learned, working together to bring mental health awareness to the mind. Dr. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Nelson, and, and thanks for the invitation. Um, when I was thinking about the talk today, I found myself uh, thinking about it mostly in my vehicle, as I often do. <clears throat> it occurred to me at that moment that <clears throat> we um, we have a fair amount of gauges on my dashboard that's telling me all kinds of things about the health of my vehicle, and I suppose its well-being in some ways. It tells me when the oil is due for a change, when it's time to check my tire pressure when it's time for some routine maintenance and all other types of data which really helps me um, know what to do next and without these instrumentations and assistance that i get um, frankly i'm i i suspect my my vehicle would not be in in great health at all and it, it struck me at that moment that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about other things uh, in our lives and, and that includes the people and and often the people in, in our organizations. So as much as we say uh, that people are our most important resource, and I, and I don't doubt the sincerity of that statement when it's used, the reality is we don't know much about the resource, and arguably not nearly as much as our equipment, where things get monitored and serviced quite regularly without fail. Now, humans are more complicated than that, but we, 
but we don't open the hood on the well-being of our workforces that often. And when you do, you might not be sure about what you're looking at. Anecdotally, we might get glimpses at what's happening. You might take a look at absenteeism rates. You might listen to coworkers and hear what's on the ground. But really, we don't know a whole lot. Some things we do know is, for example, in Canada, about 8 to 12 percent of our entire workforce today is absent due to illness or injury. And we know the consequences of that. We do know that failure to return to work costs taxpayers. It's about 10 percent of every dollar earned. We also know that, in, say, in big resource companies, the incidence rates of um, short-term uh, disability rates are about 10 to 12 percent and 30 percent are due to mental health related issues. And what that costs um, is a whole lot. On average, mental health claims cost about $17,000 for an organization and physical health uh, substantial but significantly less at $9,000. But if you do the math on a business of about 100 employees, Mental health claims will cost an average of $51,000 per year, where physical health claims about $63,000 for a to total of about $114,000 a year. Uh, the good news is this, is that I find there's been a gradual decrease in stigmatization and people are willing to acknowledge uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, that's far different than it used to be even five, 10 years ago. Uh, this elephant, though, in that room is has been made larger, and it's been made larger by the pandemic. Uh, some of the fragmentation we see in social cohesion and the polarization of groups. Um, it seems that we're more accepting of incivility, and these dynamics seem to be fueled at least in part by social media. Um, but if we are going to take a little look uh, under the hood of our collective organizations, uh, particularly in the mining industry, uh, there's some, some data that I'd like to share with you now. So you should be seeing my screen now. Is that still, is that the case, Nelson? Yeah, see it. Okay. Well, all right. So let's take a look at the demographics of a, a typical population of mining industry workers. What we find currently is you probably expect to find about almost 90% uh, of your employees are male. On average, they're in their low to mid 40s. About two thirds have at least some college or university uh, training and about that amount have graduated. It seems to be a fairly experienced workforce with about 17 years worth of employment in the industry. Now, in terms of well-being, and, and the health of people. For the last 30 years or so, um, I've really been interested in the interface between organizations on the one hand and the mental health of people within those organizations on the other. Keith and I teamed up, as Nelson mentioned, we teamed up for about five years on a very large study. And, and I, I, I can talk to you a bit about that, but I. I'd mostly like to talk to you more generally about what the numbers likely look, um, likely seem in various organizations in this industry, because they're likely very similar. One of the most frequently seen uh, issues um, is depression, at least in my world and in, in the world of disability management. And you could expect, based on some of the data we've been gathering, uh, that quite a few people are experiencing uh, quite a number of symptoms that relate to depression and they'll range from mild to severe but what we can tell you is that about you know according to our data only about 56 percent uh, would get numbers that are in the expected or the normal range so there's about 44 percent of people who are experiencing symptoms that are at least mild, but all the way to severe and extreme. Uh, 
Um, a good indicator of well-being also is, is the quality of someone's sleep. Um, it used to be the case that um, fatigue and poor sleep were indications of, of depression. Uh, we, we tend now to think more of it as a potential cause. Um, in some of the work we've done, uh, only about half or uh, slightly over half will report either very good or fairly good sleep. Um, so over, over uh, one third of people in this workforce would, would tell you that their sleep is either very bad or fairly bad. Not surprisingly then, you have a workforce that is very tired. About 80% are, are reporting uh, some, some good sized level of fatigue at an elevated level um, and only about 20%, one out of five of your workers will say that their, their fatigue is okay, that it's manageable and that they don't want to experience too much of it. Uh, one important um, thing that we've looked at is this thing that we call burnout and I'll define it more a little bit later because we have a poll on this. Um, but about um, between a quarter and a third of, of people in this industry will screen positively for burnout. And we have looked at gender differences and uh, this uh, mimics other uh, studies um, that show about a breakdown of 46% of women versus 26% of males. Of course, returning people to work after illness and injury is a very, very big um, uh, effort that we need to engage in. Um, I just wanted to show you some of the facilitators to a successful return to work, and, and, and there are some barriers, of course. One of the big facilitators to get it, getting people back on track is ensuring that they have good health care that is available to them in a timely manner. Um, but other things are very important too. The level of, level of support the worker feels from their family, the availability of modified work, the amount of support they feel they have from their supervisors or from occupational medicine, um, and the support goes down as well. Coworkers, treatment providers, uh, friends. So this whole idea of, of support is a really, really strong indicator of whether or not someone will come back to work after they've been off. We can compare with some other jurisdictions, even though there hasn't been much work other than um, recently in Canada, but in Australia, we, we see some demographics that are similar to ours. Um, there would be some differences in, in some of the few rare studies that we've looked at. Um, this is a universal type of issue uh, in this industry. And coming back to the Canadian situation, um, we can conclude that about 41% are suffering from mild to extreme levels of depressive symptoms, that 6% have moderate, uh, at least moderate levels of anxiety, and about one in 10 of workers should probably be screened for uh, PTSD. A surprising finding uh, when we looked at that number. One thing that uh, was also uh, quite important to us to look at was um, suicidality. If you look at general populations in Canada and you ask people, have you considered or thought about suicide, not necessarily attempted or planning, you'll get a rate of about 2.7%. In some very large samples of mining industry workers that we've looked at, one out of 10 have said that they have thoughts of suicide that they would not uh, carry out, but they are thinking of it. And I, I want to let you sit with that for a second. I mean, think for a moment if one out of 10 of people in your family 
right? One out of 10 people on your softball team or the class that you're taking were thinking about it, um, how you would feel and how you might react. Uh, burnout is a very uh, important uh, thing for us to measure. 52% uh, of, of workers in the industry that we've looked at are working shifts of 12 uh, hours or more. So about 30% are screening positively for burnout. About a quarter might be found to consume alcohol at what we consider to be binge drinking levels. And the personal burnout scores that we've obtained in our samples seem to be the most common and significant predictor of all kinds of things. Things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, sleep, uh, and fatigue. Now, before I go any further, I, I just, because I'd like to turn this over to Keith, but I'd like to define burnout for you. Uh, I'll give you the textbook kind of definition because you're going to reflect on this in the poll that we're eventually going to offer you. Burnout is a psychological syndrome that is emerged and emerging as a prolonged response to chronic interpersonal stressors on the job. There's three dimensions to burnout. One is overwhelming exhaustion. The second is feeling cynicism. And number three would fe be feeling detached from your job and otherwise feeling ineffective and with insufficient accomplishment in the work that uh, you do. So I'm going to I'm going to let Keith take over some of this um, going forward here for a bit. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I know when we, when Michelle and I were talking, we were looking at sort of the when we did this, we did the study together, and then when we look at at mining populations, uh, what also interested me, and now coming coming to I am Gold with the Cote project and thinking about the projects that we have are going, and then as I think about some of the other projects that are going, that Nelson obviously been involved in as well, and he with his company and and their companies and others that are sort of in more remote locations, and there's been some. I know many of you on the on this call may be part of those operations or oversee those operations or have them as part of your your um, your business as well. And I, and I think about that. There's some unique stressors there, particularly with the remote work. And there's been really good some really good work out of Australia that they're doing a lot of work in that regard. And and I'll share a few things to think about there. Some some hazards, some risks around that work that to build on what Michelle had talked about there that that about 40 to 45 percent of people that are working in remote mining operations experiencing moderate or high levels of psychological distress so that's about just about half the workforce would be saying I have moderate to higher high levels of psychological distress and with that what what typically where where's the populations that experience that is generally our younger workers it's those under 44 that usually are experiencing that those that have fewer social connections at work, those that have a previous diagnosis of anxiety or depression are more likely to have ex experienced these types of stressors and this type of distress. Uh, and what we also see there is that those who have had a, are separated or have some marital difficulties as well, obviously are gonna experience that as well, particularly with remote mining operations where you're two weeks, two weeks in, two weeks out, one week in, one week out, four weeks in, those rotations and roster styles. And what we see in those in, in those people as well is that they have 40% feel isolated, feel lonely. Uh, even though they're around other folks, they're, they still feel isolated in some way. Uh, and 60% are gonna tell you that they're experiencing challenges with the interface between home and their work life as a result of these things, which causes significant distress in their lives. Uh, and so I th think this is really important uh, because we, you know, as we, looking at healthcare and trying to care for our, our the well-being of our of our workforce it's important to consider these dimensions when we're doing assessment of the hazards at the workplace we need to be understanding and looking at those things not just out in the field when they're operating the dozer or the excavator or the drills we got to be thinking about that how they're interacting with our camp work environment um, more as a whole it's important to look at that 
And so, and so when it comes to that, and Michelle was talking about, you know, suicide and suicidality, what we know about the mining industry is it is the single deadliest industry when it comes to mental health. Wow. Number one, one number one. And what happens in mining, for example, so Michelle told you a lot about all the uh, statistics and analysis and predictors related to it. You, in mining, so if I put that in context in Canada, according to the labor statistics in Canada, 2021, there was 377,000 workers uh, that were are in the mining industry in Canada. We lose, based on the statistics, we lose about 200 of our mining co-workers every year to suicide. That's about one every two days. We lose someone in our industry to suicide. Put that, put that, transpose that onto the fatalities we've had in mining in 2021, according to stats. We had about 51 fatalities, workplace fatalities, due to uh, due to that in our Canadian mining industry. But four times that number died of suicide. Uh, so, and to to your point, I think we really need to be thinking about that uh, when it comes to how we're looking at getting to zero harm and getting to uh, caring for the well-being and health and well-being of our workers out in the workforce. So I think those are just some things to consider when you look at them. They're really sobering statistics to me because, uh, I've again, I've been involved with um, the mining industry. I've had individuals that I've been working with that have taken their own lives. And it's devastating, not only to to the their workers around them, but also the, the ripple effect to families, to co-workers, to others around them, that many others are affected by that in various ways. So I think it's really important uh, in this talk to recognize that. Uh, in, in our workforces. I just I just want to repeat that. I, what I heard you say there, Keith, was one in one every two days. Correct. One person mining in Canada every two days. Correct. Is yeah. Yeah. And so and so when I think about that, you know, and I go, well, what are the, you know, what are some drivers? And Michelle talked about that in the drivers and and I think we just need to pay attention to that. We're going to talk a bit about then how can we do that, uh, getting getting to that, and how do we care for our workforces from a mental health and psychological health and safety perspective. So, so before I get to that, though, I kind of want to pull the group here. We kind of want to see, well, as Michelle was talking about burnout, we know that is a, that is a significant issue uh, in our workplaces as well with fatigue and, and stress and all these other things that go along with that and managers. I'm concerned about managers when it comes to burnout. And so I really would like folks if they could take the poll on based on this. So overall, you know, based on your definition of burnout, how would you rate your current level of burnout? So either it's sort of one, I enjoy my work, I don't really have any symptoms of burnout right now, or maybe I'm occasionally under stress, you know, but I don't feel burned out necessarily. Or the third one, I'm definitely burning out. I think I have some symptoms of it, or I feel burned out. I might I might need to make, make some changes or actually seek some help here and this is based on a single definition of uh, burnout um, uh, that was a, a scale that was designed to kind of measure the emotional exhaustion a portion of burnout as as michelle was talking about at uh, that dimension as that dimension is is related to some of the other dimensions as well so yeah we'd like to be interested to hear what your responses are regarding that There we go. So we've got 10% on the enjoy my work answer. 65 say occasionally under stress. 21 definitely burning out and have one or more symptoms and 4% feel burned out. That's what I'm seeing on my screen. What do you mm. keep? Yeah, and, and Michelle, when I see this as well, I, I see this as uh, not uncommon in the industry you look at there that's about 25 percent as you were kind of going back to alluding back to about 25 percent of folks are feeling burned out whereas you look at um you know 60 65 percent that's your sort of at risk group that can you know you want can go down to the other group if they're not managing that in some way uh do you see that as pretty uh pretty common that uh, in the workforce michelle yeah this seems to be um a fairly typical distribution um, and at 21% you know it reminds me of of the statistic where one in five Canadians are are dealing with something currently so it, I mean it's not the same question but it's it's a parallel that I think is important and I just add one more thing the important thing is um, what we know from from other data is only about one-third of people who are at a point where they probably should get help actually do get help 
Yeah. Yeah, and I and I think that's important to know, right? Too is that that we, but and especially I think about the mining industry as well when it comes to help seeking and behaviors. Where again, a fairly currently male dominated industry, I think what we see challenges with with uh, with help seeking is an issue with regards to to men, and generally that's one of the factors that is concerning. They don't tend to seek help as as often uh, due to various reasons and factors. Would you agree, Michelle? I, I 100 percent agree. There's there's certainly sub cultural and subcultural issues that you need to consider when you're addressing these type of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So so we talked a bit about you know how we talked a bit about burnout and thank you everybody for who responded to the poll there. Really appreciate getting your input and your feedback to that. That was great. Thank you. Uh, so how do we get to how do we what kind of approach do we take uh, with regards to approaching our workplace and mental health. And I think I was, I was in a conference the, the yesterday and we were talking about zero harm. And I think many of the conversations I have with organizations is how do we get to zero harm? That's our, that's our ultimate goal. We want to get there, the road to that. That's what we aspire to. And it keeps us focused on doing the right thing and, and caring for the health and safety in our organizations. And, 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 I, and I, we, I noticed there was a lot of focus on the physical safety, looking at our risks in our workplace, looking at each task, doing a risk assessment, doing our field level risk assessments, getting out there. And I, you, there's a lot of focus on that when we talk safety, 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 and behavior and, and managing hazards and eliminating them, all those things, which is, which is fantastic. And, I, and that's what we need to continue doing. But I said, I think when my comment to that was that if we truly want to get to zero harm, we really have to increase our focus on psychological health and safety in our organizations. I think we are not fully there yet. Where we are, where we are in many organizations is that focusing on those psychological and social hazards that we were just talking about, I think are still that focus on that is still lacking in organizations that we need to continue to do better if we truly want to get to zero harm. And I was reading some studies as well on this as well. If you go, if I manage the physical hazards as low as I could probably get them, depending on where the workforce that you're in, if I didn't manage the psychological and social hazards down the same way, I would still get injuries. I would still get incidences. We'd still have get hurting people. And so at the end of the day, we need to do this together in the way managing psychological and social hazards and dealing with mental health in the same way we address all the physical uh, issues that we have in our workplaces in the exact same way. Uh, and so, because and really, when you look at the, these things like health, safety, and, and psychological health and safety, these things now, when it comes to addressing mental health in our organizations, is becoming an employee value proposition. And because you look at how we all know in the mining industry that we're grappling, everybody's competing for talent. Uh, we know we are have a, our workforces are are short. We, we're going to be working short, and there's a number of mining industries that are looking for people left, right, and center, right, and including us. Uh, and so, you know, the thing is, right? It's it, it, if you look at the stats, right? 36% of our young workers would say, look, I'm going to quit this job that pays me more to go work for a work job that work pays less, that has better mental health benefits for me. So it tells you a bit about that, the, that this, this work and that we, we're doing around mental health is really, I don't, I, to me, I don't think that having a mental health strategy is optional anymore. We, it, it is required for a company to truly hit aspire to zero harm and to do right by their employees and to attract and retain staff. I really think it's an important piece and and because workplaces will either enhance mental health or they'll undermine it. it it'll it, it can, we'll do either, right? So, so I think, you know, workplaces are really healthy, right? They provide income, they provide routines, they provide relationships, purpose, meaning, right? Achievement, all those good things that we all want too, right? But unsafe work environments will cause risks to for mental health and hazards related to psychological health and safety, and they'll exacerbate physical conditions. Because as Michelle was talking about depression, at 41%, either have mild or greater, we know that with depression, comorbidities of heart disability, uh, heart diabetes, other health-related problems, go along with that as well that are often related and intertwined there that need to be managed as well. 
So, so I think that's really important. And we, what we know from studies of mining employees that they get the greater, there's greater satisfaction. The greater the satisfaction with their job, the more su support from supervisors they get. So the more social connectedness that they are, and they perceive that their employer is committed to mental health and well-being and their well-being, it actually buffers the strain that they feel due to other things. And these are important things. And when as a, in our organizations, we want to be promoting in our organizations. So, so when, it, when I think about best practices in an organization, it comes down to this. When it, it's sort of first, first thing, as Michelle was saying, and we're, if we're going to check under the hood, I got to know one that checking under the hood is important. Because we know that the oil is important in our in our vehicles, so we need to be aware of why that's important. Then we need to know, well, how do I even check the oil? Well, you need to get under the hood. You need to have some intentionality of of knowing where the latch is and unhooking the unhooking it to be able to actually open the hood. So I've got to have some intentionality, which is really around that leadership support, that buy-in, that knowing knowing what to do and how to look at these things. And then when I get under the hood, I got to make sure, what am I looking for, right? What are the things that I'm looking for? Well, I'm looking for mental health, looking for psychological safety. Oh, it's there. Okay, great. Then when I check it, I got to know what the level means. And then when I when I, the level means, they'll to then instruct me on what I need to do to help care care for that. And it's no different with, with when it comes to our, our workplaces. So first thing we want to prevent uh, is the big thing. Reshaping our environments is and in looking at the psychological and social hazards in our workplace to make it an enabling environment uh, for people uh, with in terms of to be able to manage and control hazards related to that. So it's really psychological hazard management. And there's a really good, um, uh, if you're looking for an article on that one, we have our Canadian standard, of course, that's there, uh, that the CSA standard is uh, helps us in Canada, helps us guide us with regards to psychological health, health and safety in our workplaces. There's also a really good document out of the government of Western Australia. It's called the Code of Practice for Mental Health uh, in Mentally Healthy Workplaces uh, for Construction and Resource Sectors. Australia is a fair ways ahead of us in terms of its uh, where they are in the evolution of psychological health and safety, and we can learn a lot from them uh, here in Canada. On the prevention side, it's building that leadership culture and that culture of of civility and respect by modeling healthy behaviors in our workplaces, supportive supervision techniques, and being able to have that positive organizational, organizational culture as well as supporting employees' mental health. And that comes through training, training employee and training supervisors and leaders on mental health. On, uh, I, on this one, I say, well, we need to firstly teach people the language of mental health. How can we expect to talk anybody to talk about mental health if we don't know what language, it, how like language to use, right? So if I want to speak a different language to somebody, I, I need to learn, first learn the language, and that's why often we don't talk about it, because we don't know how to. And I think these are the things that I think that if you're going to make a step change forward, that's one of the big things. On the prevention side, it's also robust benefits. Take a look at your benefit plans, as we want to ensure that it's adequate for mental health related benefits to ensure that there's enough support there to actually get a meaningful amount of care. Uh, and because what happens is and sometimes the benefits are so low there where they're 500 or bucks or so low that that gets you next to no level of care. And we know and Michelle could talk a bit about how how uh, how much care folks need. They need definitely more than one or two sessions. Uh, if they're struggling with their mental health significantly, there's very little you can do with that. Uh, that's the challenge. And then, and then I think the second is protect, protecting and promoting your your health, your wellness within your organization. And this is where strengthening awareness skills through training uh, around training in mental health and training folks in regards to mental health first aid is another option, as well as just general awareness training on mental health about how what to look for, how to recognize signs, and then how to care for somebody when they're struggling with their mental health. These are these are skills that you're going you can learn that are easy to learn, you just need to learn them and, and how to do, how to take care of them. And it really increases your competence of your supervisors and also your coworkers to care for one another when they see something struggling. It creates that culture of being able to care for one another. And then you're in implementing sort of workplace policies and practices within your workplace to be able to, to um, provide sort of that that ground level of this is our policy this is how we how we do it these are some of the things that we we do within our organization 
And one of those could be managing crisis situations. We were talking about suicide. I've been through, I unfortunately have had, had an experience of, of a number of, of individuals that have taken their lives, but often we don't know what to do. Uh, we need to care for how do we, how does that affect others? How do we look at that and care for our workplaces will be really important and, and creating that infrastructure of supporting those healthy behaviors and the access to care. As Michelle was saying, that what, that's one of the predictors of recovery and return to work is access to care. We need to be innovating our access to care, particularly in organizations or mining operations that are farther away from, uh, from uh, big centers where there may be is more care. We need to be bringing the care to the organizations, to our workplaces. They can be done by virtual means, by self-guided means, by different ways to access care as people prefer it in different ways. And the earlier we can, we can promote care and build resilience and build, build sort of coping strategies and others as a preventative measure, that we want to be doing that to be able to protect, get folks that mental fitness or that, that, bit, that resilience to be able to manage these difficult ups and downs. But when and if, and if they are struggling, they can access means without having to wait and without having to, to spend more time there. We need to be intentional about that and to be able to guide efforts so that we can intervene early so that you don't have to leave, leave camp to be able to receive care. They could receive it right there, just like we're talking here today. Virtual care is very effective and can be done anywhere. And I think uh, that's some of the things that I think as we go forward in the final thing of support, where how we're innovating in, in providing support is going to change as we move forward, just like our just like we're changing in, in some of our operations. So I, I think if you look at those key things in the organization, that's kind of how I see embedding in the organizations of prevent, promote, protect, and support people uh, in key ways. I think it's going to be really important. Now, Michelle, do you have anything to add regarding that or thoughts that you had? Uh, just a tidbit, maybe. Uh, you reminded me of uh, some of our work together, Keith, where we asked thousands of mining industry workers if they felt um, greater psychological safety at work or physical safety at work. And they tend to say they feel more physically safe uh, in their workplaces. Um, and that surprised me a lot because I, I always thought of these places as potentially more dangerous on the physical side. Um, yeah. And another maybe a little caveat I would add is uh, I'd encourage everyone to become really good informed consumers of the services they eventually obtain if that's the direction they're about to take. Um, mental health has become a it feels a bit like the the wild west out there, and uh, if. You, you really have to know what what you're getting and how much of it you need. So talk to people. Talk to people who know. Yeah. And with and with that, maybe what I'd do is I, I'd like to we'd like to launch a poll here as well to go. Well, let me just see from the audience uh, regarding mental health strategy. Is is where is your company at in developing a mental health strategy? Well, I'd like to hear from you. Where are you at? Is it no actions at this time? Maybe you don't have one going just yet, or maybe there's some talk. That you're kind of talking about it, but not a lot of action just yet. Or you got some actions on the go, but there's really no formal strategy yet uh, in terms of a long-term strategy. You got a strategy, but you're just getting it started, just getting underway. Or maybe you have a formal strategy, full implementation, and you're working your way along. I'd be interested to, to hear uh, what everyone has to say, where where they are with their own company. Numbers are blowing Four. in here. Good. And I'm, I am i don't know if you guys could hear me typing in the background, but I'm taking questions and organizing them for the Q&A section here. Awesome. Hmm. Right on. Okay, so it looks like about 9%, no actions yet, about 14, some talk, but no action. About 44%, you know, we've got some actions, but no real formal strategy. And it looks like then on the bottom that you've got about, looks like about 34% have some formal strategy either getting started or some underway. And, and thank you, everybody. I appreciate that because this is actually about what we see in Canada. So in Canada right now, if you look at mental health strategies in organizations, about 37% current data as of 2023, about 37% of companies have a formal mental health strategy uh, designed and developed for their organizations. 
Now that has un been unchanged since 2017 data, which is concerning to me uh, that, that by and large, most organizations don't have a formal mental health strategy in place. And I think that's, to me, that I think we, uh, to me, like I said before, I don't think it's optional anymore. Where we are after the pandemic now, we know mental health has not, levels have not gone back down to where they were pre-pandemic. All the other things that are going on globally and things that are going with climate, and I, this, I call this sort of syndemic things that are going on, a bunch of different factors that are affecting people. Uh, we need to be doubling down on mental health and a strategy formally to how we're going to care for employees in the workplace if we truly want to get to zero harm. Uh, in our organizations, and and I know mining's been leading the way in some areas, but it's also lagging in other areas, and we really need to ensure that we're trying to do our best to work ourselves forward. And 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 it it doesn't have to be all. And I I think Michelle and I were talking earlier. I mean, this we've dealt with this in many organizations, and it doesn't have to be all at once. It's gonna. This is an evolution of what you're gonna do in organizations. So you know, just just do the next right thing start with something right and i think that's where um, you know our experience was and uh, just just if you're getting out and talking about it doing initial training sessions starting it at least develop a, a plan and maybe it's a two or three year plan to ease into things because you have to meet your organization where it's at sometimes you're not quite ready to get fully on full into psychological social hazard management you might start with training and education and building the foundation getting that buy-in and then starting. So there's a few ways that you can do that, uh, just getting some, getting that started. And you might need somebody to come in to give you a hand with that, to kind of help you out, to go, well, well how do I start? Because that's often where I see the translation uh, that people go, well, I don't even know how to work it into my organization. Well, you don't have to change anything, necessarily change your system. We just have to work it into your system in intentional ways. It's just figuring out how do I do that. You might need a bit of help with that. Uh, Michelle, what are your thoughts? I completely agree with you, Keith, and, and you reminded me that uh, often um, when I get the most phone calls at this clinic, and uh, incidentally, behind me is, is the therapy room, actually, so when I'm not crunching numbers, I'm seeing real people back there, um, the time that I'll get most phone calls is after a suicide. That's when organizations actually call me. And of course, I don't say this, but I certainly feel that I wish I could have talked to you before. And, and that signals to me that there was perhaps no plan. Um, and so that doesn't mean you should feel bad or guilty. It turns out that over half of people who actually do commit suicide will have hinted at it to someone, including their family doc, before they actually did it. So, so don't feel bad about that, but I think going forward, we cannot allow ourselves to sleepwalk our way through the data that we're sharing with you today. Yeah, and my experience, my experience is, you know, too with that is that that everyone in an organization, you don't have to be a mental health professional, can learn about how about suicide to have the question to ask questions about suicide to help someone who might be struggling with suicidal thoughts and get them to the help that they need. We all have the ability to do that. It's not necessary. It's not necessarily difficult to learn. It is difficult to manage sometimes because that's not an easy conversation to have. But if you have the skills for it, it's so possible and it saves lives. Just opening the conversation up that you're willing to even talk about that, other people will come forward. And so it's not so stigmatized related to related to having suicide thinking. That's it's a common thing, more common than you think in our organization and particularly in mining. Did I hear that right, Keith? Earlier you mentioned the stat. Based on the poll results we had, there seems like almost no change when you look at the percentage split in five years, right? Could you imagine if we didn't change our, our resources and reserves numbers in five years? Or when you look at mining, like that's a, it's, I think we're on the frontier of that, but uh, interesting that, that not much traction has been, been had. And, you know, we yeah. just had a one in 100 year pandemic, right? So. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what I think too. I I think that that organizations, it, I think, is an imperative going forward is that to develop a mental health strategy for their organization, at least a plan on how we're going to implement mental health 
education or training and or the, these things. And I think with, with mining organizations, I, I love mining organizations for this reason. They've got a they've got a HSE strategy. They've got HSE already a, a management system in place already. We're strong on that. They're super strong. It's just now we got to just got to bake mental health, uh, psychological health and safety into that same system. We bake it into the system in policy and risk assessment, in managing risk, in evaluating and corrective action and manager review. We we work it in to do both at the health and safety and the HR systems. It's it's possible. It's not difficult. It just takes some intentionality and some knowledge because that's what I think some organizations lack is just the knowledge that of how to do that because they don't necessarily have someone who's sort of psychological health and safety trained in their organization. Oftentimes it's off the corner of a desk of a of a safety supervisor, or safety or professional or HR person kind of thing. So they don't necessarily have the skills or competencies there. And that but that can be changed. And I think that what will help serve many organizations. Great. So, so I think with that, you know, I, I think uh, that kind of we wanted to take some time for some questions and and kind of talk through uh, talk through some answer some questions and leave a bit of time for that, Nelson. So I, I'll certainly be open to that uh, for sure. Yeah. So I'll just remind everybody uh, that's on the call and still listening. Um, to remind just just to remind you that uh, you can type your questions into the box. I've got a few already that have been sent my way. Um, but there's a questions box that you can type into the uh, go to webinar control panel. Um, and i'll I'll give it a, a moment or two there um, as we're wrapping up. Uh, Keith, uh, Dr. Michelle, any any final kind of closing thoughts on the discussion today before we jump into the q and a section? Michelle? Well, I, I think we've taken the first step. I mean, that we're even having a discussion of this topic today really speaks to the, the the great progress we've made. So that is very relieving for someone like me. Uh, talking about it tends to already change something. Um, but I think that's the first step. The next step is to create uh, teams of people who can um, kind of blaze a bit more of a trail in our organizations bring a few followers called the you know maybe some experts to help you along if you're not sure how to navigate through this terrain and then implement some strategies and you'll find that some of them uh, are already there um, with a recipe accompanying them as Keith has said um, and I, sorry go ahead Michelle sorry and well just uh, uh, otherwise uh, keep checking in and things like well-being are things that you can measure, uh, a, a bit like um, in, any piece of machinery you have. You can measure things, and there are people who know how to do that. Sorry, Keith. No, yeah, and I and I completely agree, Michelle. It's, I think you you know getting started and, and measuring because I I think that's when when I started with Valley it was it was we were having you know this X money of number of days due to loss due to due to injury and illness, and most of them were due to mental health, and we just didn't know why. And yeah, my question was, well, why? We didn't know, and everyone's like, I don't know. And so we we actually took Michelle and his team, uh, Michelle and his team, uh, we measured it, figured it out, just like you would understand risk in your workplace related to related to this or that, to understand what's going on, so you can treat it, treat the risk, treat the treat what's underlying the root causes, and figure that out to manage risk. And I, we just need to take that same approach uh, in our organizations. And I just want to sort of kudos to um, you know CIM uh, and uh, Nelson yourself. For caring about this, uh, to bring this topic forward to the industry in in that way, and and I know when you my our work together with your work and Jody and team, uh, I know it really matters, and it you know, and I I think that there's a uh, you know a lot of other organizations that care deeply about this as well and want to make some step change, and I encourage everyone to do that as well as it, as every one of our mining workers out there will appreciate that the the help and work that we do for them because because we need them to do to be successful. Sure. So I've got a couple of questions, couple more than a couple of questions here for you folks. But uh, um, one person asks uh, that they're interested to hear the number of people um, that were surveyed during that mining health study. So, so how many people were in the population of of the study? Well, I, I I've said it so many times. I know it by heart now. It's it's two thousand two hundred and twenty four people. And was that across industry or in the same company? It was all within. Um, various operations within the same company got it 
the other the other question that comes in uh another another good one here how do small firms of only a couple of employees provide this type of, of support yeah so a couple of small just a couple of small employees i mean what, what does that mean sorry nelson just like a couple like, employees like you've got like a small firm like how do you make sure that you're, you're providing that support right this is a study done on a you know big resource company but you've they've got lots of small supplier firms yeah you do and i and i think within those supplier firms uh, you know what we do even if they're small all of them anyone can participate in i think mental health training is one thing awareness of things is another uh and then and then training each other in kind of key signs of what to look for uh, and how to care for one another and looking at what supports resources you have as an organization because sometimes my experience is too is that many of our employees out there aren't even aware of where, how to access help in our organization when should I access help our might a lot of people access EAP and other things when there's a crisis when there's a lot of other resources in there that you could access ahead of that to uh, prevent prof, do some prevention work there as well. So I think in, in even in small organizations, you can be intentional about what you provide to your folks in that way. And sometimes it's a little easier when it's a little smaller uh, because it, it becomes a little bit uh, more, you can become more intentional and hit a lot of folks at one time uh, versus spread out operations tend to be a bit more of a challenge just because of uh, geography and where they are. Yeah, so the, the kind of dovetails onto this, is somebody um, gave a little bit of an account of a bad experience they had when they were seeking help. Um, and ultimately, they were told by the company uh, nurse that unless they attempted suicide or was thinking about self-harm, there was really nothing they could do for them. And that it was an HR issue. So so the question out of that story, like that, that context comes, you know, what can leaders in our industry do to create a more proactive solution than, well, you got to be right at the edge of the of of the clip there before we actually help. Yeah, I think I'll start, Michelle, and I'll kind of hand it back to you. But I, I think that you know, when when it comes to um, one, I think is is educating a one and getting a handle on what resources do we have available to us. Because not only do you have company benefits and supports, you also have community resources and benefits, resources and supports too. Uh, and I think training all of our our workforce on if somebody's reaching out for help early, how do I respond to that in a, in a positive way, in a way that's that's helpful? Because uh, that's often sometimes a challenge, uh, and we got to teach people how to do that. And then, what are the resources available to help them get to where they need to get help? Or because I remember, you don't have to necessarily like when we teach people, it's not your job to fix what's going on. Your job is to get them to the help that they need. And having a bank of figuring out where those resources are will help people to you because know, you want people to early identify you want to identify those at risk versus those in crisis uh, and so that's kind of what we what we should be teaching people and then having those resources available to individuals to seek help and support with so i've got three more for you folks um and we're running at about seven minutes to go here um so keith on your point about you know baking mental health into the existing systems um, before that happens, what business unit or group is best suited in your mind or the doctors to lead that strategy development? Yeah, so it depends. Um, normally, normally, um, what I would see is it usually falls under two areas. It's either under safety, health, and or and or HR as usually where it generally sits, depending on how your organization's uh, 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 developed. I like to keep it under safety as it is really a health and safety issue. Um, I like to kind of again. The, I find that the the, uh, the safety professionals as well are good at understanding well how what the risk management process is, what is the risk assessment process, uh, right, and how do we go from there to your risk registers to your you know managing risk. I, I I like to increase their competencies as well because this is really around identifying psychological and social hazards. You might need some support from like what are what is this psychological social hazard mean from people like Dr. Lara Vieira, who is an organizational industrial psychologist, to help make the translation to what things to look for within your organization. The uh, professionals like him can help with that, but it kind of might sit with safety and health uh, to drive it um, uh, through the organization. And you can involve HR as well as HR will have, there's will be HR systems you'll want to put things into, right? Because you've got, you've got all the other sort of, because you want to be able to thinking about mental health right from recruitment 
right through to promotion and people development and you want to bake it into those systems as well to be thinking about that uh, in, in HR as much as we're doing it into health and safety. It sounds like a collaborative effort with uh, with a couple of clear accountabilities there, right? Um, yeah, what, like... what we had, maybe I'll just finish that. What, you, what we had, what, you, what you'll probably benefit from is having what we call a, a either a psychological health and safety committee or, you know, a group, that working group that works on it together, which you'll have an HR representative, you know, health and safety representative, worker representative, just like, almost like your, your joint occupational health and safety committee. You could even train your doc, joint occupational health and safety committee in, you, you should train them in this work uh, because it's really important to get everybody's um, buy-in and alignment on what you're going to do and especially in you know we had a good, good experience in, in our unionized workplaces to be able to you know they, there's what because it's a calm it's common ground for you and it's also both important to you and, and we wouldn't have got the mining mental study done without collaboration and cooperation and some really amazing input from some from our from our stakeholders there that we worked with there, there at the time yeah and and on that note so this dovetails into the second last question I'm going to ask today. Um, do, do you recommend a particular tool for measuring that well-being survey or some other type of some other type of means? Yeah, so there's a couple, and maybe Michelle, I'll pop, pop over you in a sec. I think two, two, a couple of big key ones around measuring the hazards or measuring those what we call psychological social hazards. There's a couple of them. One there's called the Guarding Minds at Work. Uh, it is a it is a, a free survey tool to use that um, is you that you can utilize uh, in your workplace and through the Guardian Minds at Work uh, website. There's that one. There's also another one called the Stress Assess, which is uses the the Copenhagen Psychosocial uh, Questionnaire as well. There's that one that you can use as well as another opportunity uh, to utilize for looking at the psychological social hazards are a couple of key ones that, that don't cost any money to implement. They do cost, do take a bit of effort, but they necessarily don't necessarily cost money to implement. Uh, Michelle, what are other ones for you that you've seen as well that you may want to add or subtract or from that? Yeah, I'd add one to that if, if you haven't mentioned it, but um, the perceived stress scale was the one measure in our work that seemed to correlate the highest with uh, the most dimensions of health and well-being. So if, if I only had to pick one, um, that would be in my top five for sure, including the ones that Keith has shared with you. Okay. And final question. So, you know, I'll try to limit you guys. We've got two minutes left. We've still got to wrap up with the exit poll, but, um, you know, is PTSD mining specific? Oh, or are there other situations that come to mind? Like, what are your thoughts around the prevalence of PTSD in your findings? Sorry, Nelson. So the the prevalence of one out of ten needing to be screened for it um, is is what we have been finding. It, it, t can you repeat the last part of that question? Yeah. So so what are your thoughts on the prevalence of PTSD, and and is it mining specific? or are there situations, other specific situations that come to mind? Right, in the largest study we've conducted on this, we didn't separate where the traumatic event occurred. So sadly, we can't say whether it was work-related or just life-related outside of work. Uh, but be fair to say in this uh, business that you are in, it would be an over-representation of most other types of workers, um, you know, somewhat close to the category of uh, working as, as a nurse or, uh, a healthcare practitioner. Okay. And just can you give me the three tools again? Somebody asked for those three tools. If you guys can just rhyme those off and then we'll wrap things up here. Sure. So first on the, to measure the psychological social hazards, it's the guarding minds at work uh, tool. Uh, and the other one is what's called the stress assess tool. Uh, it is basically, if you look at stressassess.ca, it's through OCAL in Ontario here. And it uses a measure called the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire uh, to uh, for its for that purpose and its use. And Michelle, yours yours was the the perceived stress scale. And uh, if anyone needs help on where to find them, how to administer them, and how to crunch that data that you you'll get from them, uh, let us know. This will also be this is being recorded, and the the last screen that everybody should be seeing is the contact information for the good doctor. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. We're, we're right at the top of the hour. There's an exit poll. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you uh, to wrap things up. All right. Thank you all, gentlemen. That was fabulous. Very, uh, very, very good presentation. Very interesting. Very, uh, I think, uh, important one to have. Um, so again, thank you. And also thank you to uh, managing editor Michelle Beacom, who's uh, pulling the levers behind the screen. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees. Um, we ask that you please uh, fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. Uh, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed uh, to you tomorrow, um, along with a registration link for our upcoming webinar, Safety at the Face. Um, this will be held on May 18th, and uh, we certainly hope to see you then. And of course, you can find a listing of all of the latest CIM virtual events on our calendar of events at CIM.org. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you.